So let's go ahead and, and get started. Uh, so John Singleton Copley uh, was born in 1738, uh, passed away in 1815. Uh, his work was approximately 100 years earlier than the artist that, that we presented last week, uh, John Singer Sargent. And I think we're gonna actually see the differences in the fashion of the day and, and, and other aspects in the two artists. So, so let's uh, go on, uh, let's hand it over to Sarah. So John Singleton Copley was born in 1738 to Irish immigrant parents, most likely in Boston, Massachusetts. Um, a tobacconist by trade, his father, Richard Copley, moved to the West Indies around the time of his son's birth in an attempt to improve his failing health, where he passed away nonetheless, leaving his son's mother, Mary Singleton, to manage the family business and to raise her son as a single parent. Uh, there's kind of little definitive information about Copley's childhood, which makes his early artistic development a bit difficult to trace. Um, his stepfather, Peter Pelham, an engraver, is thought by scholars to have introduced Copley to the fine arts. And it's highly likely that Pelham in, uh, instructed Copley in both painting and engraving. But other than that, Copley was largely self-taught. So the first thing I will say about this piece is that Copley painted it when he was 16. It's a fantastic piece, let alone the fact that he was so young. So a little background. Um, so Vulcan is the god of fire in Roman mythology. Um, and he's often depicted with a blacksmith's hammer. He's the son of Jupiter and Juno and the husband of Venus, who you can see, goddess of love and beauty. Vulcan was born extremely ugly. His mother Juno tried to throw him off a cliff but failed to kill him. So instead she put him in a volcano and told him to stay there for the rest of his young life. He somehow grew to control even the fire of volcanoes and grew up to be a very talented blacksmith for all the gods and goddesses of Olympus. And here's an interesting depiction of the three gods, including Mars, uh, the god of war, whom Venus was having an affair with. Um, so Diego Velasquez, the old master, also did a rendition of The Forge of Vulcan. So it could be that as a young artist, Copley was trying to take inspiration from him. So in June 1774, when he was already 35 years old, Copley decided that he had to go to Europe. And although he intended to stay abroad just long enough to acquire more reputation and artistic sophistication, the American Revolution changed his plans. Studying in Rome and stopping in many cities, Copley arrived in London in October, 1775. There he was joined by his wife, children, and father-in-law. And in 1777 at the Royal Academy, Copley exhibited the Copley family, which portrays his delight at being reunited with his family. Uh, the artist portrayed himself turning away from his sketches. His wife, Susanna, kind of leans forward to hug their four-year-old son, John Jr. Mary, who was a year younger than her brother, lies on the sofa, while Betsy, aged six and the eldest of the children, stands with a sense of self-assurance indicative of her seniority. And the baby Susanna tries to attract her grandfather's attention with a rattle. Copley's contemporaries would have understood the idyllic landscape as a reference to the family's kind of natural simplicity and the elaborate furnishings as kind of an indication of their civilized propriety. Brooke Watson and the Shark garnered widespread praise when exhibited in 1778 at the Royal Academy. Uh, the work depicts a real event from about 30 years prior to this where Brooke Watson, a 14 year old crew member on a trading ship in the West Indies, decided to abandon his heavy clothes and go for a swim. Soon after entering the water, he was attacked by a shark. So here Copley has pictured the dramatic moment where Watson is about to be rescued just in time to save him from being attacked by the shark for a third time. Um, if you look in the lower left corner, you could, it shows that his foot is already missing. So he's already been attacked. Um, and one reviewer at the Royal Academy praised the painting for both the softness of the coloring and also this kind of frightened appearance of the man assaulting the shark. So it's a really kind of juxtaposed piece. It's, it's kind of soft and romantic, but obviously depicting this very intense, um, suspenseful scene. This is the death of Major Pearson painted in 1783. 
It depicts the Battle of Jersey in 1781, which was the French's attempt to remove British ships from the island of Jersey off the coast of France, which was a major spot for American and French shipping at the time. So although Pearson was actually killed in the early stages of this battle, the painting shows Pearson. Um, you could see him at the center of the painting under the large Union Jack flag, uh, being shot down, leading the final charge, giving him kind of a more heroic role and fate. Um, Pearson became a national hero and the painting drew crowds when it was first exhibited at 28 Haymarket in London in May of 1784 with admission charged at just one shilling. Uh, the Tate Gallery then purchased this painting in 1864 where it still is today. The defeat of the floating batteries at Gibraltar. So the painting is based on an attack that took place in Gibraltar on September 13th of 1782. The great siege of Gibraltar was an unsuccessful attempt by Spain and France to capture Gibraltar from the British during the War of American Independence. Um, in September of 1782, the Spanish formulated a secret weapon known as the floating batteries designed to fire on Gibraltar at close quarters with deadly accuracy. Floating batteries were built kind of of wide timbers packed with layers of wet sand. So they were considered kind of fireproof and unsinkable. But the British used a uh, heated shot to counterattack these batteries. So these quote unquote hot potatoes as they were nicknamed were preheated to furnace temperatures before being fired at the ships. Many were doused but a rogue heated shot or hot potato could lie smoldering in an empty ship, burning a cavity into the wood and left long enough, these would eventually cause an inferno. And we could see the beautiful blending of reds and oranges and browns that Copley uses to depict these infernos. Uh, this painting was actually commissioned by the city of London in 1783 to depict the victory of the great siege that had been won a few months earlier. And at roughly 17 feet by 25 feet, it is one of Britain's largest oil paintings. Here is a selection of female portraits that Copley painted throughout his career. Um, it's safe to say that he was the most important colonial era portrait painter. Uh, John Adams actually said of his portraits that when you see them, you wanna have a discourse with them and ask them questions. And it speaks to how realistic they seem. And if we actually think back to last week with John Singer Sargent, as AJ mentioned, they were about 100 years um, apart in terms of when they were living and, and working, but both focus on the characteristics of each person that painted and how both of these painters really wanted to bring out the life and the personality of their center. Um, here's the male portraits and we can see some of the founding fathers and most important revolutionaries of our country, Sam Adams, Paul Revere, John Adams, and John Hancock. Um, you can see, especially with Sam Adams and Paul Revere, how Copley shows them very comfortable in their skin and relaxed rather than, you know, most portrait paintings we think of as very posed. Um, and what's interesting about the Revere portrait is that Paul Revere was a silversmith by trade. And silversmiths were known for making buckles, tongs, little things like that. But the fact that he's posed with a teapot is actually quite a political statement, if we think back, of course, to the Boston Tea Party. As I mentioned, Copley is the most important American colonial artist. Um, Copley Square and Copley Plaza in Boston bear his name. You can see a statue there that was made in 2002. And even his daughter, Elizabeth Copley, was memorialized on a stamp in 1965. But as well, having lived in England for so long, he was elected to the Royal Academy and received royal patronage in 1815. Thank you. Th thank you, Sarah. Thank that, you. Was very, that, was, that was very interesting. I think those, those pieces are incredible. If, uh, you know, if you've ever had a chance to see them, I mean, you have. But I mean, if, if, if for those of you on the call, if you've ever seen them, um, you know, in person, they are just wildly impressive. Um, they're huge, many of these pieces, and they're the level of detail on there is just incredible. Yeah, I, I agree. It's just amazing, amazing painting. So, thank you, John uh, Pryor, for suggesting that we uh, highlight John Copley. It's great. Yeah, you know, and the and the portraits are are quite different than Sargent's portraits as well, as you pointed out, Sarah. Yes, I was going to say there are similarities. Yeah. You know, saying to uh -huh. the 
the characteristics of the sitters, but um, there are definitely differences as well. Yeah. So I think, you know, kind of just interesting, just a thought just came across my mind. I think with uh, phones having, you know, every phone having a camera now, I'm wondering if there's a lot fewer portraitures being painted these days. I wonder. No, yeah. Although it seemed like during COVID, the uh, art galleries, at least, you know, here in Southern California, just did a booming business. People were looking for, you know, physical art to put into their homes and, and you know, to brighten up their little oasis. During yeah, I think pandemic. particularly landscapes, landscapes and seascapes. Yeah. 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 Indeed. Well, thank you, Sarah. That was uh, really interesting to, to see his art.